Today really is a fantastic opportunity uh, for improving our safety awareness and refreshing our skills before the start of our seasons. Okay, so hopefully by the time uh, you guys leave today, either refreshing yourselves or hopefully learn some stuff as well. So um, we've got some good information for you this year. All right, and hopefully um, it will give a, a good picture as to how we are doing our, our tandem skydiving in the UK. It's still the most popular type of student training that we've got. So 2019, there was 92% of students trained were tandem, all right? Which tells us that that is our PTO's business module, all right? And that is what we need to be protecting, yeah? So we wanna be ensuring that we're always enhancing the safety for tandem, all right? Keeping those incident rates down, all right? In order to keep tandem skydiving safe, all right? So, a uh, little bit of housekeeping, first of all. Um, there is no uh, planned fire drills this morning, okay? So if the fire alarm does go, all right, there is an exit at the back over there, okay? And also we'll be leaving through this door here as well. So yeah, so if it goes off, please vacate the, the room. As you're probably aware, there is filming and photography taking place throughout the day. If any of you do not wish to be in any of the footage or photographs, then I will just simply ask you to remove yourselves, move to the back of the room, and you'll be out of shot of the camera. Um, we also have these handheld microphones here. Now, in order to enhance the audio for the video, if anybody's got any questions, I would try and encourage you best you can, get hold of one of the microphones, pose the question, and that way it's nice and clear on the video, all right, and there's no issues there. Okay. So, I'd like to thank our sponsors all right, we have uh, Romero Sports and Leisure, which are our insurance brokers. Yeah, AXA, our actual insurers, and uh, United Parachute Technologies, okay? And it's down to them and the kind sponsorship that they offer us that we're actually providing this free of charge for you guys, not only on the Friday, but also on the Saturday. So again, thank you to our sponsors. So I'm gonna start with some introductions first of all. Um, I'd like to introduce Richard McCooey, who's actually sat at the back of the room. So everybody just looks behind you. And there's Richard stood up there. Now, Richard is the Chief Executive Officer for the Australian Parachute Federation. He's traveled all the way over from Australia to be here with us for the expo, okay? And he will be delivering a presentation later on this afternoon on uh, normalization of deviance uh, when it comes to Prevent, uh, in order to prevent fatalities in tandem. All right, so he'll be doing that after lunch. We have Mark Prokos, who's uh, UPT General uh, Manager. Uh, Mark will be talking at about 11 o'clock and he's gonna be delivering a presentation on tandem instructor observation strategies. You all know Noel Purcell, all right? Every year Noel says he's not gonna be here. Guess what? He's back. <laughs> okay. So uh, Noel's going to be doing, um, in combination with myself, doing some of the statistics, all right, and also updates on the, how the Tandem Working Group's doing and some case studies, all right, that happened throughout 2019. Right, we also have Kev Dynan from uh, Skydiv Chatteris. So Kev's going to be doing a talk later on uh, at about 2-ish, I believe, or 2, 2.33, something like that. Um, and he's going to be doing a talk on DuPont Dirty Dozen, which is recognizing an error before it happens. For those that don't know Kev, hand up, please, Kev. Excellent. Some of you may know him. All right, and he's going to be working after lunch. And then finally, we're going to have Mark Bayada at about half past three, I think it is and he's gonna be giving an update on how our canopy piloting working group is and hopefully give you a bit of an insight as to what may be coming in in terms of rules, regulations, etc. All right, so that'll be done by Mark and I'm sure you'll see him around lunchtime. So uh, this morning's topics, we've got the morning session. All right, you can see the, um, what we're gonna be talking about. Then we've got the lunch. You've all had your teas and coffees in the atrium. That's where lunch will be served, all right? And then the afternoon session, all right, we've got Richard McCurry, Kev, and Mark Beata, all right? Anybody know this gentleman? Handsome chap. Handsome chap. <laughs> it's his 40th birthday today. He's not that young. Do not buy him any beer, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Do not buy him any beer. 
Will he have money instead? Probably. Okay. All right. So if you do see Frank, I think he's in the riggers room at the minute. So if you do see him, wish him a happy birthday from all uh, from yourselves. All right. Excellent. So we'll start with um, the first bit here. So what I want to do is give uh, a bit of a, uh, an update as to how the Tandem Working Group has worked um, throughout 2019. But before I do that, I want to go back to a little bit of history and going back to the first Tandem Working Group that was formed back in 2008. Uh, the Tandem Group was uh, formed in 2008 because there was a number of equipment-related issues all right, and incidents taking place all right, at our PTOs. And it was one of, uh, you probably all remember that famous incident that happened at Netherhaven with Cozzy, okay, where he, he sustained really bad injuries on his back, okay, and it was from that that they instigated the working group, all right, and it was mainly to look after or to look at the equipment side of, of, of tandem, all right. The outcome of the 2008 working group was the Blue Books. Now, everybody here is familiar with the Blue Books packing all right all that good stuff and the relevant forms so you've got the, the 112 bravo which is the blue book the 112 charlie delta and echo which is all the relevant paperwork for the equipment and the student harness all right so that was the outcome of that back in 2015 we had a, a tandem incident where the tandem instructor exited the aircraft with the student's chest strap not done up okay it was from the panel of inquiry from that that we then decided to set up the second tandem working group and the purpose of that was to look at a complete review of everything that we do in, in terms of tandem skydiving. All right, and that's now been going from 2015. So that's a bit of the, the background on that. Composition of the, uh, the 2015 working group is on the screen there. And as you can see, there is a, a number of uh, instructor examiners. There's multi-rated, we have riggers, we have rigger examiners on the, um, on the working group, all right? But we're also able to co-opt people onto the working group all right so if there's anybody here that specifically would like to be involved in any of the work that we're doing then please pick up the phone give me a call all right and we can invite you over to the meetings all right right um so let's look at 2019 uh review so <clears throat> what you've got on the screen there you've got the changes that we've seen in the operations manual all right and those changes were all implemented in november this year all right, so we introduced the C license written examination. We updated the Jumpmaster records. All right, uh, we've reviewed our Sigma Tandem Emergencies Aid Memoir. Yep, Tandem Instructor Probationary Period, which has now been introduced, and currency requirements for HANCAM. Now, the purpose of the C license written examination is not particularly anything to do with Tandem. However, the working group felt that B license, okay, as a qualified jumper, all right, to take on the responsibility of a jump master is perhaps not ideal. We did not change the rule, all right, we didn't up the requirement for being a jump master. However, we decided to increase knowledge, all right. So now, before you obtain your C license, you need to sit the written examination, which is all to do with knowledge of the operations manual, stuff like that, okay, in order to start enhancing people's understanding of, of um, you know, of the rules, basically, all right, and that way. You know, from when you get your B license up until you carry on skydiving, chances are you never visit that information again. So the idea is that when you achieve your C license, you go back to your B license stuff, refresh yourself a little bit, and now you've got the written examination. Um, we also, in conjunction with the written examination, we had to update the Jumpmaster record sheet and the canopy handling record sheet, um, and we incorporated a number of practical elements into it. All right, and again, that is just to give a little bit more proficiency to those people practicing to become a jump master. All right, and then that's actually recorded. Yeah, so it's a slight update. This will change again once the canopy piloting working group reviews the canopy handling side of things as well. All right, so please uh, watch out for that one. Uh, right, we then went on to review the Sigma Emergencies Aid Memoir. And the, the reason for that was really just to fall in line with the, uh, the Sigma tree from, from the Sigma manual. Okay, so now it's all the drills that we've got. How many Sigma rated instructors in the room, by the way? All right, you all seen the new aid memoir? Yeah, all familiar with the drills. Good. Okay, and all we've done is we've just incorporated um, a few uh, scenarios that falls in line with what the manufacturer is actually teaching. Okay, and the idea 
is once the Sigma aid memo was updated, okay, we're then going to update the remainder of the systems that we're using. So the next, strong, etc. All right. Um, so that will be done at some stage in the next couple of months. And then from just updating this, the other thing that we've come up with as well is to enhance it a little bit more because at the minute we're not seeing a great deal of incidents taking place with people getting you know, out of sequence or pulling wrong handles, etc. All right, so we want to start focusing a little bit more on what we call added scenarios. So all we're simply going to do is we're going to take the Ed memoir at the front, we'll then turn it back and on the back we'll have some additional scenarios here. And it's just to enhance the situations a little bit more so that you practice other situations that you might have not been either come across yourselves or anything like that, but it just helps us be a little bit more um, safety active. Um, and there we go. So we got obviously what, what to do on aircraft emergencies, what to happen prior to exit, so if the student has to refuse or the student has a panic attack in the door, stuff like that. Um, what to do if we have two canopies out, all right? Uh, further canopy scenarios. You know, we can't release one of the steering toggles, line twists, canopy collisions, cannot locate the emergency handles. Unable to release slide snap ejectors, you know, people vomiting on you, etc. all that good stuff. So this is going to be reviewed. That will be put out to consultation with what the drills and actions are going to be for each, okay? And that will go on the back of the uh, aid memoir. All right, and again, we hope to have that out at some stage this year. All right, any questions at this stage? Good. Right, <clears throat> one of the biggest things that we did uh, introduce was the proficiency card. Now, the proficiency card may not affect the majority of the people sat in this room right now, okay? But the, the intention of the proficiency card is to give the newly qualified tandem instructor the best chance, okay, at getting comfortable with doing tandems, all right? So therefore, he's not going to be straight in, okay, onto uh, his job zone, all right? And then he's going to be jumping in all types of conditions with all different weights, etc. All right, so what you've got on the screen is what they are regulated to. All right, so we're not allowed to do any skydives below 9,000 feet. Okay, there will not be any FS, okay, whilst they're uh, taking a student. All right, student must be sim of a similar statue, all right, to the TI. All right, so again, if the student tends to be taller than that instructor, then he will not be allowed to take the student. All right. Uh, we do not want anybody over the age of 55 years old, all right? And that is because statistical, anybody that's slightly older or more vulnerable, the older generation, okay, we want to make sure that we're getting people that are, are fitter, all right? And when you're taking that, those uh, individuals as an instructor, you stand better chances, okay, of um, conducting safe skydives. Uh, no tandems with mobility or disability needs. An experienced camera flyer may accompany the tandem instructor, clear to do so by the chief instructor. So that's back down to the chief instructor to who may video them and follow them out whilst they're in the probationary period. Um, so they must log the 20 jumps in their, um, in their personal and probationary record, which must be signed and witnessed by at least the tandem instructor. So first, there's a number of things to do on the first 10, then some stuff on the, on the second turn. So it's only 20 jumps. So when you think about it, it's not a great deal of time. All right, that's perhaps maybe four weekends. All right. Um, suspended harness just must be completed more frequently than the required calendar month. Receive familiarization brief of the type of aircraft to be used and briefed and any local SOPs relevant to tandem skydiving for that particular operation. Because again, as tandem instructors, we have freedom. We can go and work anywhere we want. All right, so you need to be familiar with those SOPs. Um, must be aware of the differences. All right, should they be jumping main canopies, they have, they have not jumped throughout their tandem instructor course. All right, because again, if you move from PTO to PTO, all right, there's going to be differences. So they need to be made aware of those differences. All right. Um, adequate time bef between jumps. So what we mean by this is we do not want to be rushing, okay, landed, get another set of kit on, and we're meeting the plane. All right, we need to be given them plenty of time to get there, compose themselves, all right, and then we go again, all right? Uh, and no more than five tandems a day, okay? And that is there purely for the people coming off the courses now, and it's a nice, easy way, okay, to ease them into tandem skydiving. You guys had the hard bit. You were thrown in at the deep end, didn't you? Yeah, so we're now looking after our instructors a little bit more. Um, and what we've got on here, can everybody see that? All right, it's perhaps a little bit grainy, maybe a little bit small. Okay, but that is uh, the probation repairing currency guidelines. All right, and this is designed for anybody that may have had a, a substantial layoff. 
okay? Then we're not just gonna go and do a tandem straight away, all right? So you've actually got to get back in the air on your own, then you've got to do some other requirements. So that's included in the probationary period, all right? Um, do you wanna add anything on that? It was just to try and protect people when they come, you know, we do understand that some people may do the course in, say, the September and then, you know, with the weather and stuff like that and, you know, we're just trying to protect people a little bit and it's just to make people think a little bit, well, the things at the bottom about being cautious in the stronger upper winds and stuff like that, just to, just to try and prompt people to think a little bit rather than, you know, we've all seen the new instructor landing further away, landing off, which just increases all the risk of people getting hurt, so it's just try and protect people a little bit. Good. Thanks, Noel. Okay, uh, and then we updated, okay, uh, currency requirements. So any instructors that have over 500 ham wrist mounted camera descents, okay, they only need to do 50 descents now in order to regain the currency, okay? So that was a rule that we applied as well, all right? Okay, that concludes the update for the Tandem Working Group. Anybody got any questions? No? Okay, good. So I'm going to hand you over to Noel. So Noel's now going to look at our statistics for 2019. Okay, good morning guys. Can you hear me at the back, yeah? Cool, morning. Right, welcome. Uh, so, we're going to have a look through the statistics. I see some of you repeat offenders are here again for glutton for punishment uh, going through it. So, bear with me. If you have any questions, please uh, shout up and uh, we'll go through. Uh, so, I'm going to have a look at from the period 2016 to 2019. And we're going to look at the overall picture. And this is going on the submitted forms and... Uh, I'll go back, I'll ask uh, Jeff and Tony perhaps for some further information and I might know some more details of it. Uh, it's based on the incomplete data set that I've got, which isn't, if you see the spreadsheet, it's not very good, it's very, very difficult to do it. So it is my interpretation of it. Somebody might find some stuff slightly different from it, uh, but it's my interpretation of it. So uh, if you have any questions on it, please ask, okay? Um, we've got here the total number of jumps which have been done and I just wanted to put this up because it, with the statistics, it's very, very easy to distort everything and it ought to look wrong and it ought to look terrible. So it's really, really difficult to actually have a, a very good interpretation of what's going on. But the, although our jump numbers are down very slightly on the last couple of years, uh, the tandem trend is up. So tandem is becoming more and more important and the general trend is on the up and we need to be doing what we can to uh, make it as safe as we possibly can. Um, and the general number of tandem incident malfunction deployment problems is, is remaining pretty static. Now, the issue that we have is that on the tandem injury, uh, sorry, tandem incident forms, it will include everything and anything. So people fainting under canopy and stuff like that, which hasn't resulted in injury, goes into it. So it's very difficult. I don't know whether this is a good number. I would rather see the number reported going up because then we know we're getting the data in, but then that makes us look bad. So we're having a look at how we can separate some of that information out so that we concentrate, you know, we look at what was a near miss and what was uh, an actual uh, genuine incident and what we're looking at. Because it's very difficult to, I would rather see more reports coming in so we get a better picture of what's happening. Um, and then, then we can judge, see the overall trends then of the actual incident. So I normally take out a lot of the, um, the things which haven't resulted in a malfunction or haven't resulted in a, in a specific injury, okay? So that's part of my interpretation with it, all right? Um, and I break them down into what's um, non-canopy related uh, and what is canopy related. So with the non-canopy uh, related information, you guys will have seen this. I break it down over each year. So this is what we had in the previous years, and these are some of the incidents that have happened, okay? So we've had a side spin, reported three maintenance issues, which is in 2016. Drogues not inflated and one out of sequence, okay? Not many out of sequence, but, okay, 2017, again, side spin, bags out, some issues with canopies, broken steering lines, damaged canopies, broken kill lines, uh, four drogues not inflated in 2017, and two out of sequence ones, which we discussed in more detail last year. In 2018, the number of reports had gone up because we'd asked people to put stuff in, so we got more reports of the people fainting under canopy and things like that. Um, so the reports had gone up, um, and things <laughs> we had the lost bag on the tandem course. I still don't know if that's been retrieved or found. Um, we had a side spin on the course, uh, one drogue not inflated, and two drogue entanglements, if you remember the one from last year, which is the pretty uh, amazing drogue uh, wrapped around, which did clear. Um, and these are obviously what people are putting in, so we know that there's going to be more side spins, prob it's probably more side spins which don't get reported, and we'd probably, we know there's probably more people who get caught up in the drogue, which doesn't get reported, okay? But um, 
this is the, the data that we've got to go on. And then we had a few other different things, like uh, somebody throwing a flag through the uh, through their side lateral. Um, uh, we had a bag lock, uh, a drogue that didn't uh, lift, and we talked about the drogue calibration, you know, as an ongoing issue. So, w and then we had the twisted uh, riser ring. So we can see there's a lot of issues there, which <laughs> there's nothing specific. You know, huge trend. There's a general, general, uh, general trend. Nothing. So this year, 62 reports in. So the reports are down. Tandem jump numbers are down slightly by 700. So it's not a massive. Uh, reduction in tandem jumps done uh, this year but obviously we are down quite a few from 2017-2016 so these this year's issues drogues one non-inflated drogue which looking at the video I think potentially was thrown as a tandem pair they weren't unstable but they're on the side so the drogue went slightly into the burble it's flicked around the packing of it was also an issue because it was a vector a drogue uh, which has been packed like a strong uh, how it's dragged out and then folded over. So there's a combination of issues there. Uh, but uh, so that down to packing. One drogue entanglement, which did clear, didn't result in a, um, a reserve deployment or anything. And then there was one drogue not thrown, which was actually on a tandem course. Um, so, uh, and that person was removed from the course, and we'll talk about that later. Some of the things which I'm, I'm going to put up now, we, are, we have got a section we're going to do on case studies in a little bit, where we're going to talk about some of those in a little bit more depth. Two broken kill lines, return of the broken kill line. Um, we've had a couple, and we are going to look at those a little bit later on. But again, that comes down to the kit maintenance with the, with the blue books, and we'll talk through the specific things that happen with those later. But it, it's back, and uh, we need to be aware of it. One broken connector link. This, these two happened at my place. Uh, the broken connector link wasn't noticed by the instructor until they brought the kit back to pack. OK and uh, the twisted connector link. So we had a discussion with it, and I went back to basics with my guys. We, we started thinking, about, okay, obviously we all check the canopy to make sure it's all right. Generally, everybody takes the main toggles off before they start messing around with any laterals. But with our brake system, we, we use Icarus, so there's no brake settings on the main or the secondaries. Um, we have the, the wraparound, which is still there for if you did have excess uh, to be stowed. You take the mains off, you don't actually see underneath if the secondaries are clear. Now, we haven't had it, but we, we started talking about a few different things and what can happen. And with, the, with new catchers pulling it back, if they pull the brake line through, we've seen it wrap around the guide ring. Okay. Now, if you haven't checked it before you're going to pick your secondaries up, which we always do before our downwind legs, so you know, between 1,000 and 1,500 feet, that's a little bit late. We're too low then to, to cut it away. And with our Icarus setup of two on the primary and six on the secondaries, without those secondaries, unless it's absolutely howling winds, you're not going to get any flare and you're going to get hurt. And that's resulted in a broken back at our place and a broken ankle over the years that we've had these canopies. So, you know, it's just getting people to go back a little bit. We pop the covers. I tried to encourage the guys to pop the covers open so you can see that your secondaries are running true. Because if you've got an issue, you can deal with it at 5,000 feet. OK. So, and then coming down, checking the connector links. You know, we, we, think, we all think that we would see that. But it wasn't immediately obvious to the guy. He's not, he wasn't a complacent guy. All right, it wasn't immediately obvious. So it's just going back and thinking again a little bit about it. And the twisted <coughs> connector link was, I said to the guys, check that, and then check where your handles are, you know, what we teach students, you know. So we, took, we all took a step back, we started noticing and talking a little bit about it. And also now following the issue which we've had with the Swedish links, getting the guys to check if the RSLs become disconnected, okay, and just reporting that so we can have a look at the maintenance of those. But with the twisted connector link, the, it had opened up and one of the links was twisted. The barrel was inside the riser. The guy couldn't see. He made a judgment call because we'd had a broken one. So, you know, what's the probability of it been broken? The last thing is it going. So he, he elected to cut away and deploy his reserve, did it nice and high, landed on, nobody's hurt. I'm frustrated, but you can't tell the guy off because he's made a decision. We could have been in a very different scenario if that had popped out at 7,500, 200 feet and they'd rotate it into the deck. So it's just getting people to think a little bit about it. So um, just keep your eyes open and see what's going on. Uh, one container came open in free fall, and again, we're going to have a look at that later, which was questionable outer sequence deployment as well. <laughs> we'll come on about it, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll have a look at a video later on. And uh, we had one bag lock. So that's all we had, one bag lock. So, you know, um, again, it's the drogue issue there, which some of them can be dealt with and can be looked at. So 
Um, when we look at it, I break it down and have a look and look at how people uh, classify their malfunctions. So there'll be twists, there'll be distorted canopy, which I'd have to put down as a tensioner, and there'll be those with a line over, classic line over. So we, I break them down, have a look, and this is what we had in the previous year, so in 2016, and 66% 6 were caused by packing. 2017, 66% caused by packing. 2018, 76 caused by packing. Okay, so this year, okay, 59 miles. So the number of miles has dropped down a little bit, okay, which is good. Um, we had two damaged canopies, okay. Uh, one of them had 1,964 jumps on there, and the other one had 1,684 jumps on them. So they're getting, the 1,900, I think, is getting close to its, its age. Uh, you know, it depends on what you're, you're running. I normally run to about 2,000 jumps on the canopy, subject to the porosity of them. And I found a massive issue with the porosity of the, uh, the colours of the material. They are not all colour materials are the same. Um, and particularly we notice, and mainly uh, on the student canopies, with the, anything with the orange in, which uh, PD use a lot of, the porosity of that goes very, very quickly compared to the white or the silver. Okay, so it's just something to be aware of for the rigor, guys. Uh, but, so there's two damaged canopies which were ripped, um, and they resulted in reserve right. Two brake issues. So the issues have gone down, so we're looking at a little bit more, which is good. Uh, those were brakes which were locked on, trapped, and couldn't be released. So, uh, so it's still there. So it's you know it's you know it's a big reduction, which is really good. So hopefully people are looking at their packing. One step through which caused it. I'm guessing that's probably not the only step through that was jumped, and I'm guessing a lot of step throughs got landed. Okay, for people make it, it, it does happen, but it's just something to be aware of. But one did result in a reserve ride. And again, these are setting the brakes and the step through are unnecessary ones. Two streamers this year, again, both of them on A2370s. Last year they were on A2340s <coughs> with um, concurrent uh, uh, sequential uh, serial numbers. These ones are, uh, there's a few different jumps in between, uh, serial numbers, so there's a gap between the serial numbers, but they are roughly the same sort of area. But it's just that people need to be aware if you jump in an A2. And the thing is, that's only two over the whole country, so there's not many. And that's the problem that we've got, that it can be appear an isolated incident at one drop zone, and it's an isolated, but then there is a pattern arriving. So that's what we're trying to look at with the bigger picture sort of thing. So it's just something to be aware of. We've noticed with the TX2s that they really do snivel, <laughs> and they are nice. It's a lovely slow opening, but when you've had a, a tandem instructor who's been jumping just the ordinary 365s, swapping to the, t the TX2s, it does put the wheelies up a little bit occasionally because it is particularly slow. But it's just passing that information on. So if people do start <coughs> jumping different canopies, that's where that came about on the proficiency card, just to warn people, you know, if some, so if somebody's jumping from, from a Sigma to an A2 canopy, there is a chance it may snivel, just be aware of it, <coughs> okay? Uh, only three distorted specifically recorded as line overs, <coughs> okay? And, but 34 tension knots. Okay, that's how they're recorded. Now, the tension knots, um, the, uh, the usual culprit is the hop, uh, and there were 12 of those tension knots were uh, caused on the hops. Uh, and normally, that's way out in front, where in the previous years when there were only 19, again, it was the same similar sort of number, it was 12 last year, so that was a big proportion. However, this year the Sigma's catching it up a little bit, so between the, um, the 370 and the 340, there's 11 tension knots, so that's, that's changed a little bit, so there's been more tension knots on the, uh, on the Sigma's. Now, the issue that I've got is I don't have the number of jumps per drop zone done on the specific kind of canopy. All right, so I'm making an assumption that the Sigmas are becoming more popular. Okay, the hop's still a popular canopy. I know there's still quite a few drop zones who use, only use hops. So um, we just need to be aware, but it is an issue that is starting to appear now with the, with the Sigmas. Um, the other canopies, it, it, it's spread out. There's an easy out there still set, 366, they had one. Uh, the Icarus have less tension knots because they're a little bit more prone to the twists. Um, and then this year there were nine twists. Uh, those were four on Sigmas and five on Icarus uh, canopies. Uh, <laughs> one of the big changes is we had, we last year we had five reserve rides, no sorry, 2018 we had five reserve rides at Hibblestow which were caused by twists on Icarus 365 canopies. Last year we didn't have any because I've, I've changed how we do the packing. We pack everything on a hook now and we've really tried to be consistent with the packers, and I think we had, uh, hopefully, we may well have dealt with that. 
but if you'd thrown my four or five in, then very quickly, again, it distorts the numbers with the, with the Icaruses. But it's just something to be aware of. The Icarus canopies are quite a little bit more prone to the twists. Um, and we tend to be getting less on the TX2s than on the original 365 style canopies. So packing on the hook, has made, I think, has made a big difference for us. Uh, the package is a little bit less tired at the end of the day and stuff, so uh, it's working. But still, 75% of the mouths are caused by packing issues. Okay. Now, that doesn't include the twists. So that number there doesn't include the twists because we know that all the packers blame the tandem instructors with their body position. You were all turning when you pulled the stop handle. Okay, so they blame us uh, for the twists. We never turn when we're pulling the deployment handle, so we always blame the packers. So if we do blame the packers, 92%, 79%, 92%, 88% of our mouths would have been caused by packing if we blame the packers with the twist. But you still see that three quarters of them are caused by packing issues, not by the instructors pulling handles out sequence or not throwing the drones. So the packing is still the big, big issue that we've got that we need to be looking at. So considerations, packing monitoring, looking at what you're doing, guys, looking at who is packing, how they're packing, what they're doing, spend a bit of time looking at it. Packing on hooks, I think, has made a big difference to us. It took me a long time to get the instructors to do it, and then the packers. And finally, we had one who'd done it abroad, and they were like, oh, yeah, this is the easiest way of packing. It has made a difference to us, I think, and being consistent with it. The other thing I think we need to look at is the line replacement system uh, schedule. Okay, there is a guideline out now uh, for replacement of component parts. Okay, and a lot, I think we need to be really, really co uh, conscientious about that. If you don't, if you work at a centre where the kit is provided for you, all right, please, you know, bad weather day, go and have a look, see how many jumps from the line set. You know, you're looking after yourself. Your rigger might well have missed it on that particular kit. Each month, I record the AAD uh, jump numbers. Okay, so I have a schedule. I can tell you exactly how many jumps are done on each component, and that has really made a difference to us. We haven't had a broken line in eight years since we started doing that. And I, for me, it's just easier to replace them and uh, replace it rather than think, oh, that'll do another 20 jumps, that'll do another 20 jumps, and after 20 jumps, having a look, will it do another 20? So I've just tried to stay on top of it, and we have had a lot less kit-related issues with that, but I think it's something to bear in mind. So, you know, there's no reason why you can't go and look at the blue books if, you, you know, if the kit's provided for you, but have a look and see. Okay, and I think it's just complacency. Uh, we just, you know, we've, we're trying to make it as safe as we can. Uh, everyone is trying to do it. Nobody is trying to be a cowboy out there. We know that, you know. Um, and, you know, the, the issue that I've got, you see it, you guys are not the complacent ones because you're here and I'm preaching to the converted already. But you guys need to go home and have a look at it and chat about it with people. And every year I've been worried about it. We had the main reserve entanglement a couple of years ago. We had the one where the uh, free bag took a long time to come out the container uh, and we've been circling and we have unfortunately seen fatalities abroad and we, we all think oh it's not going to happen it's not going to happen it can't happen over here it can and it is coming and I you know and then this year we've had a canopy collision on landing which could have resulted if that had been 50 60 foot high of four people dead okay and we've had an AAD save which we'll talk about later so we, you know the plug is out the you know it, we are circling that plug hole Okay, and I don't think we, can, we can't be too complacent about it. And we've got to be really, really careful. You know, that's the closest that we've come in 20 odd years to a fatality. You know, you, know, you can't get any closer than that. So we just need to be there. And, and just because you think it can't happen, there is the chance out there. Everything is idiot proof. We just breed better idiots. Okay. Um, so injury reports. Looking through every year, dislocations. Okay. So, in the last few years, seven dislocations. Now, all those on the report were declared as previous injuries, and that's where people basically just lie on the medical. They're going to lie on it, they're going to see it. This year we had nine, okay? Only five of which were written down as previous dislocations, okay? So I don't know if, I don't know if somehow somebody is managing to dislocate them or if the person just didn't know, okay? So, um, uh, so, but we just need to be aware of it and check in, check in our paperwork and checking them when they're in the brief and, and when they're on flight line, you know, you know we, still, we just need to be careful. So I break the injuries down into non-landing and landing specific injuries. So non-landing, two aircraft. One fell off a ladder climbing in, all right? That was somebody, yeah, but that wasn't a, that wasn't a student. That was uh, a guy on his instructor course. Uh, climb, you know, who's, who's done it. And he got a serious injury, a nasty injury on his arm, wasn't able to carry on jumping. So we do see it all the time. And, I, you know, 
we have a guy at our place, we put the ladder up, he's too keen on giving everybody a fist bumper to climbing in rather than looking where the end of the ladder is, you know. We've got you know, to be careful about it sort of thing. So it's really, really simple things. One person missed the bench sitting down and ended up with a back sprain, 70-year-old. Okay, so it's due to care how we're looking after people, you know, you, you wouldn't believe it. One was bruising due to the harness, nine disgates of shoulders, as we said. They weren't all commented on whether they were previous injuries. Eight passed out under canopy. We know that there's a lot more than that, but these are ones who've landed, passed out sort of thing. Haven't resulted any injury to them, but they had, uh, had done. Two post jump reports, one fainted, one had, air, uh, had head pressure, and then when they cleared their ears, they started bleeding from their ears. I was like, okay, so, uh, you know, we just need to be careful if people have got head colds and stuff like that. So, uh, but, uh, so that, that's what we get, and that's kind of like what we would expect, a little bit of bruise and stuff like that. But for climbing into the aircraft, we need to be careful about it. Go home, think about check out your ladder, what, what condition your ladder's in, who's holding it. I know that sounds really daft, but it'd be pretty embarrassing. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be on somebody's video as well. So you're going to be absolutely scuppered uh, illegally, all right? So landing injuries. Going back, five instructors hurt in 2016, 48. On the reports, people need to be honest. And we're going to speak to John Cause and ask him, and I want to get something out there. So that I think everybody's paranoid about writing on the form, but the instructor made a mistake. All right, if, if somebody's made a mistake, write it down. Okay, you are still going to be insured. Okay, and I think too many people are too scared to write on the form what actually happened. And without it, we can't trace it. Um, so and out of those, we found that 74 were overweight, if you can read that. 2017. Seven instructors hurt, only three caused by the instructor, definitively as in bad landing and stuff like that. 14 fractures, six, seven overweight. Now that's overweight in the whole population of the, of the injuries, okay? And I'll show you why in a second. 10 fractures last year, um, but 79% were overweight of people who got injured. Uh, 2019, 35 injuries total, okay? So the total number of injuries have gone down four to instructors, 31 to students, okay? Five are caused by instructors, that's where I can look at. And now, by that, it's not deliberately turning it into the ground or anything like that. A couple were caused because people missed the PLA. They'd landed in grass, so they'd missed the landing area. That's an instructor's accuracy issue, okay? Um, but 13 fractures, and 69% of those people were overweight, okay? So the numbers are staying roughly the same. And again, this, this, this lower line of the serious injuries, again, how we classify is always a problem because that includes the dislocated shoulders. So if you take dislocated shoulders out every year, the number does come down, all right? Because it, that's actually technically classed as a fracture as it goes in, so it's a serious injury. So we're, we're pottering along the same. My worry, my real worry is that standing here every year and a lot of people think, oh, it's okay, we're not doing anything bad. The numbers are going up, the trend's up. Injuries are staying the same, therefore we're getting better. This should be going down, and it's not. And that's my worry, and, that, you know, and I, don't, I don't know whether I'm people, uh, I don't want to be reinforcing the, the thing that, oh, what we're doing is okay, it's not. We need to be looking at how we can get it down. Um, so any ideas are appreciated. Um, so last year, the way the injuries were <coughs> written down, I could split them out into heavy landings, which were caused by the instructor, Twists, uh, bruising, and fractures. Various different things, you know. And we had a look at this with a 50 with female. We'd had people caught bruising was caused by people sliding the landings in, uh, and the fractures last year. One low secondaries, one low turn. That's how it was reported, and one of the canopy was still turning, which is a low turn. Those were, you know, caused by the instructors. Only seven attributed to the student dropping their legs, but we saw that 80% of those people were overweight. Okay. Yes. What do you mean by overweight? Overweight is uh, over BMI of 25. Right. Okay, 20, 20. Is yeah, over. The length of the yeah, no, ah, yes. It's the it's as as classed by the BMI. So overweight 25, and we will have a we'll have a chat about it in a moment because I know we have people. Who, uh, BMI isn't a perfect guide. Tw over 27 and a half is is very overweight, and over 30 is obese. Okay. Um, and we know that BMI isn't perfect because, you know, a lot of, I'm, I'm technically overweight, all right, but I feel fit and healthy, and we, we know that it's not a perfect guide, but uh, it, it's a guide, it's somewhere to start, okay? Um, so this year, last year, sorry, should I say, the, 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 there weren't any put down as instructor caused ma majorly, so I could only really break it down into bruising, okay, so to me a bruise is where someone's taken a knock, they walk away, 
are going to be left with a slight mark. It's nothing significant. That person would be able to jump again. So one, one was a poor flare. One was an issue uh, back caused by turbulence. Um, another bruised back, three bruised legs. One was unknown. The person had gone to hospital uh, with pain and then it came back. And so on the form, I've got no idea because people aren't updating the forms. So they say it's a suspected injury, it goes away and the form's not updated later on. So one of the things is if people can update the form, if it's, even if it's a day, two days later, right on the bottom of the form, or use a continuation sh sheet at the back of the book and send it in. Because it's very, very difficult if they've got suspected ones, whether they did actually end up to be broken or have we got away with it in terms that they haven't broken it. All right. Um, two were winded. One was a crosswind landing, and one was where they've stumbled and then the instructor's fallen on them. Okay, so that comes down to our, our landing issues sort of thing, our control. Um, only 55% of those were overweight. Um, only three of those happened in less than 10 knots. Five were sliding landings. Three people didn't know what kind of landing they did, so I guess that's an arrival. Uh, so so I, I don't know, so it, does, it doesn't really help me, okay. Um, Sprains. So sprain to me is something where somebody isn't able to jump again. It's a twist. It's um, not a dislocation, but it's not as far bad as that. But it's, they're not going to be able to jump again. Um, a lot of these resulted in um, uh, a check out at a hospital, but didn't end up uh, being a break. Seven were caused by a student dropping the feet. This year, it, the number had dropped. Last year, it was 100% female. This year, it's an, well, six out of seven, so six out of 13 were female. Uh, Seven out of 13 were sliding landings, whereas last year all the sprains that were caused by sliding landings and people dropping their legs. So there isn't a major trend there. Overweight we'll have a look at in a moment, but 85% of those were in less than 10 knots. So it is the slider, it is the low wind landings which are caused in the sprains. Okay, so we just need to be acutely aware of that. Um, fractures, 13, 12 to student, one to an instructor. Okay. Um, nine were attributable to the student dropping their legs. Okay, uh, I know that we're all quite quick to blame the student, but when we have a look at it, I think that generally that is the ca it is the case there. Um, overweight wise, um, we'll have a look in a moment, but 40% of the votes were in light winds, less than 10 knots. So there's some confusion, you know, I think it's people, 11 were sliding landings, you know, so it's a sl the sliding landing is, is, is an issue. We need to be aware of how we're doing it if the students aren't able to pick their legs up. But the good thing was there was no issues with people not picking up the secondaries. There was no low turns in there reported, and there was no canopy still turning. So there's no low turns. So some stuff is improving. So last year was, was good for that, and we need to try and maintain that sort of thing, keep working on it. So that was good to see, but we still had 13 people with fractures. Okay, and we do have to, you know, we have to, we have to be really careful with that because it can have a massive implication on somebody. A, they might not be able to jump again, <laughs> and you know the whole story sort of thing, you know, they you know, they can't work, they lose the house, Mrs. Lee's and dog dies, you know the stories. But we just we just we do need to be very, very careful. So I went back and looked at the sprains, and this is what I got off the spreadsheet, okay? So we can have a look. The age range of ages uh, ages is very varied, okay? And last, people always ask me what kind of harness it was on. All right, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a range of harnesses there. It's not just like one harness issue because a, uh, where I had been discussion, oh, people like the Sigma harness, you less like, but it, does, it doesn't bear that out, okay? There's a range. The injuries with the sprains, lower back, sprained neck, that's when they fell over, uh, sore knee, it, it's, you know, muscle tear and stuff like that. So it's, it, you know, it's all over the body when they take a bump and a sprain, all right? And the cores generally, the legs down, the instructor rolled over, and the kind of landings are there. So you can see it's a lot of sliding landings. Everybody does think the sliding landing is safer, but we have to be careful with it. But the big thing was, when I went back and looked at the weights, obese, obese, very overweight, very overweight. Right? And I know we have this talk every year, because uh, Cyril, you, you brought it up about what the BMI is sort of thing, because, you know, big lad, is he uh, technically, you know, if we're, uh, we could be overweight. With the overweight, that person, I don't consider them majorly overweight, they're the same size as me, but they're 200 pounds, so that's still 14 and a half stone you shift in, and the other one was 193, so that's just under 14 stone. So that is still a big unit that you're taking, although, you know, so it is, it is there. And the only ones who, the, the, the ones who weren't technically overweight, one was a tandem instructor who sprained his ankle, got caught in the divot. The, uh, yeah, and then we had one partial canopy collapse, someone caught in the divot. 
so we can see that weight is, is still an issue. And then uh, applied the same thing to the fractures. We looked at it. There's more older people there, all right? So you can see there that the weight is definitely an issue. The, 18, the male 18, uh, the lower back issue, the one which is overweight, I know we, we showed before that, you know, overweight, he, he was 196 pounds, I think, still quite big, okay? And he landed first, and he's six foot one, and his instructor was five inches shorter than him. So he's going to sit, whichever harness you've got, he's going to sit lower in the harness. Once they've dropped, they're going to be, and it is his backside that hit the floor first in 19, not wins. Okay, so I think the person who picked that, it wasn't the fact that he couldn't pick his legs up, but it was the mechanics of the landing which damaged him. So I think the instructor's legs were up higher than his, and he's taken it onto his, onto his lower back and broke his back. Uh, it's a hairline fracture. It wasn't, uh, you know, so it, it, it just shows that weight is there as an issue. So we have, like we said, we always have a discussion about BMI. I went back and looked at our BMI for the drop zone for Hibblestoke, and this is our, our female BMI. They, they, that's the frequency, the number of people on the left-hand side. Those are the BMIs across the bottom. And if we go, f if we, uh, if we say overweight, you can see that most of ours aren't, aren't overweight, but we do have a fair whack of people overweight and then obese. So you know, and with the men, you have a tendency for more men to be overweight. Well, sorry, as an equal distribution of people being overweight as underweight. But with the wi you know, with the women, it's definitely not weighted that way. And that's, a, if you excuse the pun. Um, that's, that's ours. Now, at the moment, that's obviously only working on our data from my drop zone, and that data isn't incomplete because there was about 200 people where the people putting their paperwork in couldn't decide if they were male or female. So I don't know in this day and age. Uh, so I had to remove them because I didn't know how, how they were going to if they were going to skew the, the the data. So I had to remove. So this is only on the completed data set that I had. Hopefully this year, because now with the new PIM system, everybody has to enter in the age, weight, and height. So. This, um, the data that I work with in terms of the injuries is only on the people who got hurt. It doesn't show me the whole demographic, but hopefully this year, next year, shall I say, I'll have the whole demographic and we can have a look at where people are getting injured. So we are going to step forward, so hopefully no. we'll have some more changes. Are they self-declared the weight or are they weighed? We weigh everybody. Though all these people were weighed, okay? So, uh, yeah, all these people were weighed at our centre. Okay. Yes, Steve? No, that's not recorded. No, I don't have that data. No, that's good. No, I haven't got that and I haven't thought of that, no. No, I don't. No, I don't have that data. No, I have a very poor data set. And I don't know how many jumps we've done at a specific centre because it's commercially, you know, commercially sensitive sort of thing. So I could turn around and say, well, my centre's three times safer than theirs. I don't have that data. Oh, yeah, 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 they do, they do. I was wondering if the percentage has gone up since that I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. Um, but it just shows, you know, I think it shows that we, when we look at the fractures, the, the four who were obese were female, that weight is definitely an issue. So further analysis. I've passed the data on, on how I classify it to Liz Hurahan, who works for the Met Office, and she loves data. Uh, and she's doing loads of stuff on it. And she comes up with this weird magic st stuff like this, which I've got no idea how to interpret. But she can look at it and work out where the uh, trends are and stuff like that and the associations. And she's come up with, uh, initially, working off the last four days, she's, she, she's done it in a very quick period for me. We have uh, the, the association. Lower tandem instructors tend to have issues with breaks and twists. So, you know, that's packing lower tandem experience. Maybe they're rushing, maybe not watching, you know, as the catchers pull the, uh, the brake lines back through. Um, so there is definitely an association between low tandem experience and issues with brakes. It does bear out over the data she's looked at that you've got tension knots on hops, twists on Icarus, okay? I don't know what will happen as we go on with more sigmas coming into play. Uh, smaller canopies are more likely to have tension knots, she's found out. Okay, which does bear it out, but it applies that your 370 and your 340, and now people are jumping the 310s. Uh, we just need to be aware of that, and your instructors need to be aware, and we need to be very, very careful with the lines as we're packing them. 
and that BMI is associated with severity of the injury more than age. Okay, because I thought it was more, although the, you can see those more of those people are older, she looks at it and actually it's the BMI. So the heavy, the, if the heavier they are, the more likely they are to have a, a severe fracture, a, severe, a fracture rather than a sprain. So, it, it, and that's, so what I'm pleased about is what I've been spouting on for four years, she's backed up and she's having a look at, so it is there. And she's going to do a load more work and then next year she'll have the full data set and hopefully she'll be able to help us do a little bit more and we can find out some more trends. Because what she can also look at, she knows how to do it, look, she, can, she pulls all the data and pulls it out and look for correlation between wind speed and injuries tandem experience and injuries and she can she can pull all those data out so next year hopefully we'll have some more associations okay but one of the things that she did say she 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 really struggles because the, the information is not filled in correctly okay wind speeds missing harness is missing uh, you know you know did the person go to hospital and stuff like that so uh, it's a plea please 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 spend that little bit of extra time filling out the paperwork or double checking it to make sure, because what you consider has been a minor you know, thing, you're reporting it for reporting's sake, um, actually, if it's not reported properly, we can't look at the overall trend and it's not helping. Okay, if we can improve the data set, we can hopefully get more out, and then maybe we might be able to find that one thing which could help reduce injuries. Um, so just, just be aware, particularly on flight line, you know, like I say, I'm already speaking to the converted, you're all here, it's for guys, the other, however many tandem instructors are outside who are not here. But have a look on flight line, you know, like the 79 year old taken by the guy who's only got 15 tandems. I bet that wasn't the only tandem instructor there on the day. And I bet there was, you know, so, you know, just be aware, work together, okay? And, and just say no if you have to, with, with the weights and the heights and stuff like that. If you're not happy, swap it around, okay? Be like Zamo, say no, all right? Um, so, right, I'm, I'm out. Right, thank you very much. <laughs>